Yeah, watch it. Uh, got the verse on the track. This is that on the boards. Church. This is my girl. Wow. Yeah, the statistics shows my ballistic flows in a rape get cake. Not with candles that spark your teeth. Uh, uh, O's. I'm so ready. How to pack my clothes? I'm so happy with no D. How them boys? I rock them gators more than gun beat boys. I'm the real raw deal. Y'all just steal decoys. So, and yeah, it it, it comes it transform from fiction into realism even though it is a work of fiction for that green like the fuck break no not from new orleans but can you see me homie in oh my check check one two if it ain't a check a text that's all i'm gonna do my check check one two if you ain't talking dollars i can't understand you my check check one two if it ain't a check a text that's all i'm gonna do my check Check one two. Yeah. If you ain't talking dollars, Let's I go. can't understand you. Yeah. Look around, left, right, up and down. So in a time before everything starts, and the second book kind of gets into the very beginning of it, and then the third book kind of ends up the first phase of what happened. My target audience when I wrote it in my head was the um, were basically teenage girls that had read Twilight and were sorry that it was over. From the season. And the, the animals from being asymmetric. But you know, you, you're the bus driver. Right. You know, yeah, there he is. You know, I have like a cool, like a big boy. My check, check one two. If you ain't talking dollars, I can't understand you. My check, check one two. If it ain't a check a text, that's all I'm gonna do. So one two. My check. Check one two if you ain't talking dollars I can't Why should our kids eat healthy? That's a good question. What happens when they don't eat healthy? Well, eating unhealthy leads to an unhealthy life. What can it lead to, you may ask? It can lead to childhood obesity, which leads to diabetes, high blood pressure, and also heart problems. It also can lead to our kids taking medicines at an early age and also extended hospital stays. How can we bring awareness to our kids about childhood obesity? How can we bring awareness to our parents about childhood obesity? Bringing awareness to our kids and their families about childhood obesity helps the whole family. Everyone is healthy and everyone is happy. I think I might have a solution. Follow me and let's see. Our political analysis. How are you doing today, Bob? Good. How about you, Michelle? I'm doing fabulous. Thank you. Well, I have to get in my political question for the day before okay. we get into all this creepy, scary fun. All right. What are you expect? What are you anticipating for this year with the election? It's hard to tell. If Donald Trump does a lot of the things he said he's going to do, he might move the country back towards a free market capitalist economy, which would give us a booming economy and you know, increased jobs and wealth and all that. But it sounds like that's the direction he may be moving in. And if it is, it's going to be a great thing. What do you think he's going to do for the author publisher world? Well, if people have more money, they'll buy more books. So that'd be a good thing. Well said, well said. I totally agree. Well, today we have Jonathan Rand with us. Now, you got an opportunity to read a couple of his books. Did you enjoy them? No, that's one book. And I can see how youngsters would really enjoy them. Youngsters, you're a youngster. Yeah, not really. Oh, well, in some, in your own mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, a little bit about 
about Jonathan Rand. I'm sure many of you have already heard of him. He's very famous. He's an author of more than 65 books. And his series include American Chillers, and that's one of the most famous, along with the Michigan Chillers. And a lot of the books of the Michigan Chillers, of course, are based about little towns around the state of Michigan. And America Chillers ventures further out, of course, the whole United States. He uh, lives in northern Michigan and near Indian Village, where he has a store called Chiller Mania. If you're ever traveling to Michigan, it's a definite place to come visit. And I can't wait for you to just sit by your seats and be ready and come on back. And we're going to bring him into the show and we'll all get to meet him. Watch it. Uh, got the whistle on the track. Is that on the boards? Church. This is the market. Wow. Yeah. Welcome back to APN TV Media, author publisher network. I'm Michelle Meyer, your host, along with Bob Beatles, our political an an analyst or analyst? analyst. You like analyst. Analyst. Yes. Okay, well, well, that's what we're going to call you then from now on. All right. Well, I'm excited. Creepy, scary, whatever be the case, I want you to meet Mr. Jonathan Rand. Kind of become my trademark. All right, well, if you start winking, I'm going to be really scared. <laughs> I'm liking those. Bob, you need a pair. Yeah, I could use a couple pairs of those. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you the big ones. There you go. Yes. Well, welcome to our show. I'm so excited. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's amazing how many books you have published and from not a long period of time. We'll get into that a little, little bit, okay. but uh, 65 books, over yeah. 4 million in print. Yeah, yeah. Where sure. do you put yeah. them all? So, uh, well, hopefully in the hands of kids and adults around the country. So. Well, I'll tell you, my son reads them, and my nephews read them, and in fact, I read them, so I have to say, they're great books for children, teen, and also children of my age, and Bob's age. All right. So I'm excited. So let's go to commercial, and when we come back, 
We're going to find out the nitty gritty on Jonathan Rand. Thank you. Yeah, watch it. Mm. Got the whistle on the track. Set on the boards. Church. This is the market. Wow. Yeah. Now there's a lot, there's many questions I do want to ask you and there's a lot of things we're going to find out today. I want to start off talking about Chiller Mania. Okay. <laughs> I think that is just an excellent, excellent, I've toured there, I've been there and it's kind of like an Indian River Museum. Yeah, yeah. It's just books that I publish and we, uh, it start, we, we've been there for, uh, since 2006 and it just it, it, it kind of became a, we needed a place for you know corporate warehousing and offices and uh, we just needed a place for people to come they come they were coming to our town looking for myself and looking you know and and I didn't really have any anything available for for people and I thought well if we're going to do something like this it'd be great to have a you know a store for people to come to and to, so as far as you know not necessarily um, a museum might be kind of a stretch, but you know, but it is a retail store, and I'm I'm there quite a bit in the summertime. So I guess I call it a museum because you yeah. have a lot of different decorations. It's, creepy. It's like Halloween all year round. It really is. You know, and there's skeletons everywhere and bats hanging from the ceiling. Life size so, mummy. Yeah. I took mummy. a picture next yeah. to that because yep. I'm a mummy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the snake. Yeah. Yep. And a big big rubber snake. It's rubber. Yeah, rubber. Yeah. So yeah. just giant six foot uh, spider hanging up in the corner too. Yeah, that's so, my favorite. Yeah. I wanted to pet him, but he. <laughs> look kind of too close to being alive. <laughs> now, um, let it, tell us, I, I know all our viewers are very interested a little bit about when did you start writing? How old were you? you know, in a roundabout way, um, you know, I started writing books in the, in the late 90s, um, but I really started writing right out of, out of um, I got a job at a radio station when I was 18. I was going to college, and one of the uh, things I had to do at the radio station was write uh, radio commercials and, 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 uh, you know, and, and news and such. Um, and it was a, a part of the, the job that I just fell in love with. I loved sitting in the production studio and, you know, doing these crazy voices and, cre and just being creative like that. And, um, and, and essentially that was really one of the reasons why I, I got the job uh, in the first place was because I could read well and I could, I could write well. And, um, it and helps to be able to read and write if you're writing if a book. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it wasn't until years later um, that I, you know, I, I, I was always been a voracious reader and I kept getting ideas for stories and I would think, oh, somebody should write a story about this or somebody should write a story about this. And then finally one day I was like, well, you know, maybe I should be the guy. And uh, so that's really kind of how it got started. I sat down and it was 1995. I was living in a little cabin in northern Michigan. I had an idea for a story and I thought, well, I, I really don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to see what happens and, and, uh, and, and start. And I'm going to write for a little amount every single day and see where it goes. So, now your first book you published, did you publish in India? Yeah, actually, I, I was uh, picked up by a publisher early on um, with another novel altogether. But in the meantime, I started writing a, n another story, which was actually released as an audiobook. I, I wrote it and narrated it completely as an audiobook. And that came out first.
Oh. And that was an independent, completely independent. It was, I mean, I wrote it, narrated it, produced it, put music and sound effects, assembled everything, did all the du mass duplication, shrink wrapping, everything from the ground up. And uh, In your little cabin. In our in little the, cabin wow. in the woods. Everything was, everything was there. I had a, a high-speed cassette duplicator. Cassettes, of course, were the... Still, oh. still around. So you were time. after so, a track. So uh, yeah, after that's a good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's really kind of how it got started. And, and there was a demand. The audiobook did fairly well regionally, and there was a demand to have uh, have it really as a novel. Um, so I had uh, taken the money that I'd earned from the audiobook and um, and self published as a novel. And uh, and there were two books out that that same year. Um, was one was called Saint Helene. That was the audiobook, and then came out as a novel. And that was a Haunted Lighthouse story. Okay, so thriller. So another, yeah, yes. yeah, and okay. then another one um, uh, called Ferocity, which is about there's a, a fish called a muscalunge, which is a sport fish, and they get r very very large. And if you've ever seen them in the water, they're very vicious and they're very ferocious. Is this a Michigan thing? Michi yeah, well, they're they're in the Midwest and in Canada as well. They're they're very wide, but they're a big game fish. But they're I did a lot of scuba diving, and we'd come across these once in a while, once in a great while. You don't see them very often, but when you did. It was always unnerving because they're very big and they're not afraid of you. How and big? They they get up uh, five six feet. They get, they get very large and they look. That's a like, Michigan shark. Yeah, they look like <laughs> barracuda, and that's what this story is. It's called Ferocity, and it's about a, a fish that lives in Mullet Lake. Only he gets to about twelve foot proportions, and he eats people. So it's. Well, kind of a science fiction type thing. And, and, you just uh, cut down on the amount so of swimming I'm going to do, yeah, be doing well, a mission. I, I, I stopped swimming. <laughs> I, I, I freaked myself out so bad. So, yeah. Well, then you know it's a good so, book. Yeah, well, but I have fun writing it, for sure. So. so that's how you started. And then how and when did you get started with the children? Yeah, that's, that's children. you know, and, and that's a, a great question. Um, while I was writing Ferocity, the book about the fish, I was trying to come up with a metaphor. I was trying to describe, um, there's a, a fictitious town called Corville, C-O-U-R-V-I-L-L-E, and it's just a, a little town on Mullet Lake that's obviously fictitious. But I wanted to describe what it would be like um, if you took everything about the community and put it in a beverage, you know, and take all the clean water and the fresh air and, you know, the beauty of northern Michigan, you put it in a bottle and you put it on a shelf and you sold it, what would you call it? And I came up with, I just jotted down a bunch of different um, you know, titles for this beverage, and the one that I settled on for the book was called a Corville Cooler. So if you read the book, Ferocity, you'll see where I use the metaphor Corville Cooler, but one of the titles... What is a Corville Cooler? Corville Cooler just happens to be a fictitious beverage that okay. encompasses everything about that's great about northern Michigan. Okay, so it has the lakes, yeah, the air. Yeah, exactly. The that's that's okay. what that is. You put it in a bottle and sell it and be a millionaire. Mm. And that was the whole... Someone I, might take that idea and I, do it. Might, well, that's, that's, that's kind of what happened with this, was that one of the, the discarded titles that I did not use was called A Michigan Chiller. Okay. And I kept thinking about that and I, over the summer, and I thought this was the summer of 99, and, and I thought, you know, it sounds like a, like a series of books. It sounds like a kid's book, you know, and I, and I had been going through, uh, as fate would have it, I'd saved a bunch of my books that I had read when I was growing up, and I was always reading scary books, you know, mm -hmm. you know creepy werewolf or Dracula. And okay, so you've been in this realm and oh, in this world uh, yeah, for very much so. a long very, yeah, time. Yeah, very much so. And, okay. and then I thought, I started seeing these books, and I started reading a couple of them again, and I, I had just as much fun reading some of these as I remembered back when I was in, you know, third grade, and, and I was the kid that... You know, we'd get the book at the library and take it home and have a flashlight underneath the pillow. And I would sit there and, you know, and years later I would find out from my parents that, yeah, we knew you were doing that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought I was like being sneaky. And, um, but anyway, that's what I decided to do. And I thought, I'm going to, uh, this Michigan Chillers. And I came up with this idea of, you know, places that I had visited, places that were popular. And, and then I thought, you know, if this kind of takes off, then... Um, you know, maybe we could do American chillers and expand. And I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm familiar with Mackinac Island, and we don't live too far from there. And I'll start with that one and see what happens. And and uh, it it just it took off. And so was that it, your first so one, the that, Mackinac Island? Ma May Mayhem on Mackinac Island was the first one. It came out on March 2nd of the year 2000. Now, do you uh, go to these places? To the book or you to the places that I, yeah, there's places that I've been to. And the first six books in the Michigan Chillers are all, if you take a look at the titles, you know, Poltergeist of Petoskey, I lived there for about six years, and Aliens Attack Alpena, and they're all places based in northern Michigan. And I started traveling quite a bit. Um, and uh, you'll start seeing titles, Kalamazoo, Dinosaurs Destroy Detroit, and, you know, things of other, other, other places around the state. 
That, that, that might have really actually happened. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, so, okay, now you've gotten your, all the places, mm -hmm. and that's where your books are based upon. Now, what about the characters? The characters change from, um, from book to book, and that was one thing that I started right, right at the beginning. I wanted to do something unique that would, you know, that, you know, I was looking for something that was different, and that's one of the things that appealed to me with Michigan Chillers was that it was something that was new. It was something that really nobody was doing at the time. And uh, I wanted to do something that would give kids kind of an idea as to what to expect in the next book. And I had already, before Mayhem on Mackinac Island was published, I had already written a good portion of a book called Terror Stalks Traverse City. Oh. And um, I had the, at the end of Mayhem on Mackinac Island, I had the two main characters, Sandy and Tim, meet up with a boy by the name of Matt Sorensen on Mackinac Island. So Sandy and Tim just have this incredible adventure and they're you know, thankful that they're alive. And they meet this kid on Mackinac Island who's from Traverse City. And they're like, you're not gonna believe what happened to us. And Matt's like, well, you know, I'll tell you what, you know, you know, tell me about it, but then I gotta tell you what happened to me this past winter in Traverse City. And so they're like, really, what? And he says, well, let's, you know, I'll tell you all about it. So, so it leads into the next book. So all the, all the characters are different, but they all have a different story to tell. And each of, the book, each of the books in the Michigan Chillers and the American Chillers are like that. In some way, shape, or form, the main characters of the book meet up with the main character of the next book. So it kind of makes it a unique. And then, of course, the first four or five chapters of that book are published at the end of the book. So Mayhem in Mackinac Island has oh. the first you know, three or four chapters. You tease of, the audience. Exactly, yeah. And, and they decide, you know, it's like, well, you know, and hopefully they read it and think, well, I've got to, you know, I've got to get this book. Or, you know, they might read it and think, well, no, I'm not interested. I'll go, you know, get another one. But, you know, it's a, obviously, hopefully, it's kind of like a, you know, like a, a cliffhanger and they have to go get the next book. I noticed that they're available on the Scholastic where the children get to order their books through school. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Great. So they, you, you get through the Scholastic book fairs and you know, Barnes and Nobles and uh, you know, and online and we do quite a bit of good business, business through AmericanChillers.com, our own website. So. What do you enjoy the most about writing these chillers, the American Michigan chillers? Yeah, I think the, for me, um, I like the fact that every, it's different for me every day. Um, I am not an author that sits down and just likes to write all day long. I mean, I, I, I will do that, and I like to, I do enjoy writing, and I write a lot, but I, I also find that I like to be creatively stimulated um, through other means, whether it's traveling, um, I love you know, interviews, you know, things mm -hmm. of this nature. It's just, it's something that's different, and it breaks up the routine, and for me, that's what I thrive on. I like doing, I, I do a lot of different things. You know, I know some authors who don't like that. They would rather just you know they're 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 cool right. with yeah they're cool with you know staying at home and uh, or staying at their office and just hunkering down and writing and staying focused and that's what works for them and well, I, d I don't see introvert when I look at you I don't read that you know at what, all. I, I don't funny. know why you know it's funny because I, I maybe was, it's a tie huh? yeah I don't know I I, I uh, <laughs> yeah it could be it's, I I when I when I am introvert, intro, introverted I'm very very introverted and I'm very very to myself I I, I will spend a lot of time when I'm alone writing, I really need that quiet time. I really need the, the private time. Um, I'll go to the UP for a couple of weeks at a, on a stretch and stay there in a cabin in the middle of the woods and do nothing but write. Um, I travel. Uh, my wife used to travel with me quite a bit, and now I pretty much, because I'm doing a lot more traveling around the, the country and a little bit overseas, um, so it's a little more economical and convenient right. for me just to travel. Um, and uh, thankfully, she's very understanding of that because I do... Um, I do like the time alone where I can just sit down and stay focused on my story, stay focused on the things that I'm doing. Well, how long have you been married? 
uh, let's see, it'll be 19 years next month in February. Well, congratulations, yeah, but she might need a break, yeah. too. Yeah, that's true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, I, mean, I, I don't know why this is, but when we were traveling together, we traveled together for uh, 10 years, and now some other family demands, it requires her to, you know, to be at home quite a bit more. Um, it was hard for me to write, and I don't know why this is, but while she was, because I get up really early. I mean, my clock goes off at 3 o'clock. I'm up oh. at 3 every single morning, but I go to bed relatively early, too. But for me, that time is my writing time. So I'm up like every day at clockwork, 3, 3.15, and I begin writing right away. It's like within minutes I'm writing. And it's difficult to do that for whatever reason if my wife is in the same hotel room because mm -hmm. I feel like I'm going to disturb her and it, there's just something about it. So I will wind up going down to the lobby right. of the hotel and then I have the TV playing. It doesn't bother me. I can sit in a restaurant, noise all around me, and I, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. I can kind of you know, completely tune out and focus, focus on, on what it is I'm doing. And I don't, you know, it's weird. I don't have a... There's really no explanation to it. I just, it's something that seems to work, and so I, I go with it. So. How long does it take you to write one of, let, let's, I know you've written other books, but yeah. let's, um, probably about the size of the American, Michigan Chiller, American Chiller. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a couple steps in the process. If, if I had just, if I had nothing to do except w do, um, write the story, I like about a week of writing and then about maybe two to three weeks of rewriting, rereading, editing, and that sort. And I do that. The, the, the uh, fastest book I ever uh, wrote was a book called Catastrophe in Caseville, Michigan Chillers, number 16. And I wrote that book in th about, th well, three days. Wow. But, the, but I'd set it up properly. And when I, when I say that, I mean I created an outline you know, mm -hmm. for it. And I rewrote the outline. So I spent a couple of days working on that outline. I knew exactly what chapter, what I needed to do in every chapter. I, needed, I knew how the book was going to end. And, um, and when I wrote it, I sat down and it just, it just clicked off great. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes I wind up getting a different idea and changing things and, and such. So, um, so, but if I have a, a good seven to 10 days to write and then another three weeks of rewriting, I always start, um, go back to the beginning and I start reading out loud. And if it sounds kind of clunky, I'll either rephrase it. I wind, up ch I, I wind up chucking out an enormous amount of stuff. I wind up doing a lot of deletions and getting rid of things. And, you yeah. know, if it, if it, unfortunately, if it doesn't fit, I don't care how well it's written, it's got to go. So. And you do your own editing. So I do my own editing, and then I send it. I do the best I can, and then I send it to my editor in Michigan. She's, down in, she's in, in, um, actually in Plymouth. And it's funny because every time I do, I, I, I work on my story very, very hard. And I think, you know, I'm going to send this off to Lynn. And she's just going to send it back, and there's not going to be any marks on it because it's so good. And I didn't, not I made no mistakes at all. And <laughs> I, can't, you know, I get it back, and it, it's all marked up, and all these, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And, and a lot of it's, you know, not that's digital, but but I know now she's, I mean, she finds a lot of these mistakes and things, and and it's because I'm too close to it. And you know, for the first few years, that's fact, that's actually how I found her was that um, she had read. Uh, one of my books I was doing for a college uh, project, and she said, you know, I really enjoyed the book, but there was a couple of typographical errors, and she pointed them out. She's very polite, very professional about it. And I was, I was very appreciative, and at the time, I was like, you know, I'd, I would really like somebody to help, and sent her a letter back saying, hey, uh, want a job? <laughs> so yeah. that, was, no, that was 14, 15 years ago. And See, she's meant still to be, it's yeah, meant to yeah, be. She, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a lot more questions for you. I mean, we have, we have a lot more to talk about. We talked a little bit about your store, but you also do this author quest. But we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to find out a little bit more nitty gritty. Thank you. Yeah, watch it. Mm -hmm. Got the whistle on the track. Set on the boards, church. This is my the customer you're trying to reach is not available. Please call back 19T2. The customer you're trying to reach is not available. Please call back. Data transfer complete. The world has turned against this. They have not done it. Oh my God. There has been... Alright. Forgive me, Father, or I have sinned.
lay hospitalized in critical Welcome back to APN TV Media. Glad you could join the show. We have this, our excellent, excellent, chilling author, Tonica Rand, here with us today, along with Bob Beatles, of course, our co-host. And we're just getting into the really guts of a lot of questions, but Bob has a couple that he has for you, if you don't mind, Bob. Well, the book Nebraska Nightcrawlers reminded me of a movie I saw fairly recently has, um, have your books spawned uh, other authors uh, getting into the same area, people making movies about very similar things uh, as you've been writing about here? Because I know the one I saw, there was a night crawler in an area like Nebraska coming up and attacking people, <laughs> and the way they killed it was they threw the bait over a cliff, and the night crawler just smelled it. He didn't realize there was a cliff there, and he came right out of the ground and <laughs> died going that way. And I just wondered about that. Did that uh, has that occurred to you that you've spawned uh, some more authors and things you like know, that? You know, I, I think maybe it, that's a possibility, but I think also um, there's a lot of the things that I write about are things that I, I grew up with watching. You know movies on television. I was a big fan of anything that was uh, like that Godzilla movies, uh, oh. anything of the sort. If it had a kind of a creepy nature, um, I was writing about it. And I think that probably creeps up in a lot of the books that, that I write. And I think as well, um, at least I would hope that they've also been an influence for other kids. I love the creepy stuff, the ghosts and the things of that sort. Anything I, that goes bump in the night. I, anything that's like you. that. And, uh. I think, and I think a lot of kids do. And I think that's one of the things that, I, that really a lot of kids, that not, you know, it's not just boys, it's girls, you know, it's of, of, of all ages and genders. I think we all um, um, uh, like that at one point in our life are fascinated by the things that it's are It's adrenaline. Creepy. It's yeah. adrenaline. Yeah. What scares you. Yeah. Uh, but you can close that book. It's like, <gasps> you know, and then you're safe. So. Until yeah. you go to sleep. Yeah. Then yeah. they come out of your closet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or under the bed. You know, so. Well, that leads me straight into one of the very amazing things that you do provide and you offer for children. And I really, I think it's important to our viewers to know this, especially if any of their, any of your children are interested in writing, or if anybody, I don't. It's it's an, oh, tell us about it. It's called Author yeah, Quest, it's, right here. Yeah, it's yes. Author Quest. It's it's uh, it's it's four days and three nights. It's for it's basically for kids ten to thirteen who love to read or love to write rather. Um, if you uh, if you're into it doesn't matter if you're into poetry, fantasy, science fiction, nonfiction. If you love to write, this is the camp for you. And you think about it, it's um, our art. art also? Or we do we do a little bit of art. As okay. a matter of fact, we have a, a really wonderful woman by the name of Kim Diamond, a very nationally, well, world-renowned photographer and artist, and she's she, one of our current instructors, and she comes in and does a class with the kids, and that's one of the things that I really, um, I really try to uh, drive home, is that, um, you know, if you sit at the table and never leave, you never have anything new or interesting to bring back to it. And so that's what I really want to do with these kids is that, you know, yeah, fo writing is the focus, but we do a lot of natural resources programs. We're outside a lot. We do lots of different things. So the kids really don't like know exactly. Activities? Exact exactly. Yeah, well, we, got, we have hikes. We have different things. We have, uh, uh, we've, in the past, we've had a raptor specialist come in and bring... Um, she's a, she does raptor rehabilitation, red-tailed hawks. But she, you know, she had a golden eagle one time, you know, and this golden eagle is right there on her wow. arm from me that's, to you. That's been huge. Yeah, and kids get to experience that, you know, up close, and it takes them away from what they're doing at that moment, gives them a different experience, and it recharges the the energy, recharges the batteries, refills the glass, and that's one of the things that I really try to drive home is the relationship that we all have with our natural resources and you know sometimes it's not necessarily about putting a pen to paper it might be going for a walk in the woods it might be sitting down and just and just watching and experiencing i mean if you never leave your house what are you going to the red house exactly. yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I, you know, it's kind of, I joke about it, but I'm, I, I mean it in all seriousness. It's the most selfish thing I've ever done because I, at the, uh, I want... Author questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it why really is, that? is It really is because, um, and I, I talk to all of our instructors before camp. We have about 28 of them who come um, and they, they, they get there before camp. And at the, end of, at the end of the camp, after the four days, and we send the kids off, they've graduated, and I personally want to feel like I'm walking on cloud nine. And the only way I'm going to do that is that if every single kid that comes to camp leaves on cloud nine themselves. Right. And I want, I want you every- You make me cry. It's oh, the I mommy want every, and me. Oh man, I tell you, it is, it is by far, and this is, this is a spin-off from the book, something that I never ever planned or never thought of. And to get letters from, kid, from parents and say, you know, I don't know exactly what happened yet, but my son on the car ride home did not shut up about you know, camp. And he's already on his way home. He's wrote, written his application and essay for the next camp. And we uh. have kids that have been there now for 10 years, and they come back as counselors. Um, you know, they've gone on to be writers. We've got one guy, uh, Dominic Turcott, who writes for magazines. He's, he's do, living his dream. He's been wanting to do this since he was 10 years old. Wow. He'd show up to camp. I think his camp, first camp, he had a fishing pole. <laughs> and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be an outdoor writer. And now he's like 22, 21. He comes back every camp as a counselor and he is a freelance outdoor writer. And it's just, it is so fabulous. And just to, to see this grow every single year like it has has just been something that I couldn't plan. And it's just been really magical. Where are the facilities at? Because they stay the night, I take yeah, it. Yep. There's uh, bunks it, and showers. Yep, exactly. Showers it's Wolverine camps in Wolverine, Michigan. So it's, uh, you know, it's about, I would say, 35, maybe 40 minutes directly south of the Mackinac Bridge. Okay. And it is a kid's, it's a camp that was, it was yeah, uh, years ago, it was like a trout uh, farm. Um, so the kid the did, that brought the fishing 40s, pole so. had something to do? Well, yeah, there's a pond there. Okay. Yeah, there's some, there's some streams there. Um, but it was bought, I'm not sure exactly when, but it was turned into a camp. So it's um, a camp that is, you know, kids go there for band camp, cross-country running, okay. things of that sort. And then I lease the entire camp for the five days. Well, and we do it three times a year. So, so for those, those periods of time, we just lease it and we bring our staff in. And we have uh, the boys' dorm and the, and the girls' dorm and the boy counselors and the girl counselors and the instructors. And everybody stays there. And I don't live too far from there, as a matter of fact. So I'm there all the time. They're all day long. So and it's for three days? F it's four, uh, four days, yes. Four then. days, yep. three four nights. Four days, three nights. Do you know yep. the dates coming so, uh, up this year? The first one is uh, June 14th through the 17th. Okay. And the second one is August 2nd through the 5th. And uh, they do fill up. We have 60 kids every year. So they're not quite filled yet. We still have some okay. spots available. But they do fill up. Yeah. And there's more information. Hope you're all listening out yeah. there. <laughs> Might be getting some phone yeah. calls here shortly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would encourage if anybody's interested to get their application and essay in right away. There's an application. The process is an essay about why you want to come to camp and what you expect to learn, and that has to be at least 100 words, and then if just a, a very, very short uh, application and, and such. So we just want to make sure that the kids that do come to camp um, are kids that love to write. This really right. isn't an introductory camp for kids that well, my writing isn't very good, this camp will make me uh, better. Yes, it will, but it really is for kids that love to write. And they're just, this, these are kids that are possibly thinking about, you know, man, I might want to, I might want to be a writer as yeah. a career type thing. So. Well, it's very interesting to read into a business administration and the of your degree. You have to you're, do. You're going to be writing. doing exactly, exactly. I mean, there is and structured writing, but this is more creative. Yeah, it is. It's more creative, and we we really. And this is a place where where that creativity really is celebrated. You know, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of kids have a tendency. In fact, I know a lot of kids have a tendency to feel like a misfit. They feel a little out of place because all their friends are into hockey, soccer, basketball. I mean, well, I'm a writer. Well, what do you do, you know, as a writer? And, and this is the place for them. And when they get there, all of a sudden they're meeting kids from all across the country that are just like them. You know, they might write different, they might be different, we're all different, but they're like, hey, here, oh. being different is cool, and we celebrate that. The creative juice is flowing. Oh, it's amazing. amazing. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And at the end of camp, we, always, we all have a, a, a wrap-up meeting with all the instructors and counselors, and it's every time it's just like, 
we are amazed at these kids and, and what, what they write. So I'd be a little old to go to the camp? Well, yeah, I don't think, I don't, just, I, just you, a little that, past you that. that cut off, missed that cut off a little just bit. Yeah, <laughs> a little. It does sound, wouldn't it be nice it to have something around our county good. or different yes, areas? Yeah. It's the only and one in the world, right? As far as we know, you know yeah, yeah. It, There's it, a lot of day camps that, you know, colleges will put on, but I think this okay. is the only camp that I know of. That the for kids, this age bracket? Yeah, for that age bracket, yeah. And that's like, that's when you started. That's when your dream began. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I think, you know, when I look back on it now, I, when I was growing up, I never really thought about, oh, I'm going to be a writer when I grew up. I just kind of mm -hmm. fell into it when I was 18. But, you know, at that job at the radio station, I, it played a key role. I had the ability for my creativity to kind of um, uh, flourish, and that kind of started everything. Why should our kids eat healthy? That's a good question. What happens when they don't eat healthy? Well, eating unhealthy leads to an unhealthy life. What can it lead to, you may ask? It can lead to childhood obesity, which leads to diabetes, high blood pressure, and also heart problems. It also can lead to our kids taking medicines at an early age and also extended hospital stays. How can we bring awareness to our kids about childhood obesity? How can we bring awareness to our parents about childhood obesity? Bringing awareness to our kids and their families about childhood obesity helps the whole family Everyone is healthy and everyone is happy. I think I might have a solution. Follow me and let's see. I wonder if creativity is something you're born with. Or so, and I'm sure it's something you can enhance as you I grow. I do, and I, I think you can. I think for everybody it's different. Uh, mm -hmm. I think for me, I've been able to, for, uh, been fortunate to find out what I need to do to, to, to be more creative. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything I do is going to be fantastic. I love, like, I make um, homemade uh, journals for writing and such. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they might not necessarily be the prettiest things to look at, but they're functional, and I love doing it. I have mm -hmm. a fun, I, I love doing it. And it k gets me completely away from my writing project. And I don't know why that's important to me because sometimes I'll come, I'll, I'll be working on my journal or working on something, and all of a sudden I'll get an idea for a story or for a current problem I'm dealing with in one of the stories and it's it's just it's amazing how it happens but that's the way it works for me. It all is kind of interconnected. It yeah. comes from somewhere. Yeah. Well let's talk a little bit. Let's give a little <laughs> advice out there to our viewers that you know possibly have published books mm -hmm. or in the middle of it or wanting to get their book published. Now you be began as an indie author mm -hmm. so is there any advice that you could offer out there, where they could start, how to... I think, you know, the, the, there is, uh, uh, the place to start really is right now. It really is right now. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your, um, uh, your education level is. Uh, if you've gotten, if you've always been wanting to think about writing a book, I mean, it really is now is the time. And you don't have to go uh, the traditional publishing route. You know, you could spend years sending out manuscripts. You mm -hmm. could spend, and this, and it can be frustrating. It can be, you know, very, very daunting. And a lot of people, they don't like that rejection. They don't, you know, it's, it, yeah, I don't think well. anybody really, anybody does. Um, for me, I just, I, I knew right away that once I got started writing that I loved it. And I thought, okay, well, I'd really like to, 
and I'd really, I'd really like to sell some books. That would really be kind of cool. Make some money and at what yeah. I love doing. And right? I had a background for years with, the, with my radio, a little bit of background with the radio station that I worked at, and I thought, well, I can, I can use that to my advantage. And I think everybody um, has something, uh, adults anyway, have a, has something in their repertoire that they can use to bring something to their own table to help market their own works. And if their desire is to, f to go a more traditional route, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but you can start off by, by doing you know, self-publishing. It's, it, it's really changed quite a bit since yes. I started in 2000. Now you can get your book published and you can go out there and you can um, you know, make it a success, uh, depending on what your idea of success is. I've worked with authors um, who simply want to record the story of their life to have a book in hand to give to family members and right. say this is what it was like. And, um, and that for them is very successful. They're not going to uh, turn it into a job or a career, but they're it, it, they, they feel good about it and, and mm -hmm. they enjoy it. And, and I think that at the, at the end of the day, that's what's really important to me. I mean, I'm very fortunate to be able to make a living doing this, but if it wasn't fun, I'd be doing something else. Right. <laughs> so. Well, they always say that everybody out there has a story in them. I believe that. And, just, and, yeah. and if we could all learn each other's stories, maybe we'd all have a little more compassion for yep. the human race and I, each other. I agree. Have you ever considered writing something in a humorous way, like Mars Attacks, where the you got the goofy monsters, and they're being killed in a very humorous way. You know, I've done a little, just a, maybe a little bit of that um, with uh, dinosaurs destroy Detroit, and I, you know, a catastrophe in Caseville about a giant cheeseburger that attacks the town. So, you know, to to an extent, a little bit. Um, but it's always been, and that's the nice thing about, I think, about the American chillers and Michigan chillers in particular, is that it doesn't lock me into a specific genre. You know, you take a guy like Stephen King, who mm -hmm. is really known for the horror genre, and I disagree with that. I, you know, I think if you're a good writer, you're a good writer, and if you read a lot of Stephen King, you realize that it, it, he's got a much broader array of, of skills than just writing you know, for horror. Um, I, I can write science fiction. You know, I write mm -hmm. Aliens Attack Alpina or Alien Androids Assault Arizona. I can write, um, you know, thriller, horror, ghost stories. There's a kind of twist so on just the title alone. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Nice. It's fun coming up with the titles, too. I always start with a title. I, I, I pick the title first and then build the story around the title, which is not the way most authors do that, but it works for me. So. Do you have any advice for our viewers on any type of book? I mean, everybody, you can also write a book, you can get it published, but it can sit yeah. there on a shelf promoting exactly. your book. And, you, and, and that's the thing that, uh, that's the hard work. It really is. You know, when you have your, you think, wow, my book is finally finished. Man, the book and is I love my book. Yeah. But. But you got to get it, you know, you got to get it out there. And, mm -hmm. and that is, um, that's something that, where you know you really have to take a hard look at what is it that I do, what what have I written about, how can I bring this to other people? Um, whether it's visiting libraries, mm -hmm. constantly you know going to book signings or you know and conducting book signings, whatever. There's got to be a unique uh, perspective that you have that is different, um, and you have to work at it. Um, you can't just have your book and then think, okay, uh, I got this great book, uh, now everybody's going to buy it, because mm -hmm. it just doesn't work that way. And, and that's the thing I really try to stress with, even kids too, and I try to say, hey, you're, you know, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to spend some time. Book, even if you're, a, if you go with a traditional book uh, publisher, um, they're really going to want you to go out and and do signings and um, for me I enjoy it I enjoy that I enjoy the whole public speaking aspect of it it's a big part of my career and a big part of what I do so for me it's just kind of fun and brings different ideas to my own table so and the amazing people get to meet yeah. exactly yeah it is it's a lot of fun it could be a little uh, tough, tougher task for a younger child but yeah we all have to come out of our shell sometimes yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah right well we're going to take a quick commercial break and after this a little bit more with Jonathan Rand thank you Yeah, watch it. Mm. Got the worst on the track. Put that on the boards. Chuck, this is the market. Wow. Yeah.
squats. I'm so young. I'm so young. I'm so young. Quit if you want to, boy, but we need you out there. Welcome back to ATN TV Media with the exciting Jonathan Rand, of writ the writer and author of American Chillers and Michigan Chillers. Did you enjoy the show today, Bob? Yes, it was very good. Very I learned a lot. Yes, yes. And I thank you for coming on the show oh, and taking your time. My pleasure. Thank you. And all the interesting information. Watch the bottom of the screen throughout the show and there will be information for you on Author Quest and also Chiller Mania and the websites to be able to contact Jonathan Rand if you have a child interested or if you have any questions. I want to thank you for joining us on APN TV Media and get out there and get your children some books. Read on and write on. Take care. Mwah. Yeah. Watch it. Uh, got the words on the track. Set on the boards, church. This is the market. Wow. Yeah, the statistic shows my ballistic flows in a rape big cake. Not with can't those that spot yeah, teed them up, uh, uh, O's. I'm so ready, how to pack my clothes. I'm so happy with no D, how them boys. I rock them gators more than blood beat boys. I'm the real raw deal, y'all just still decoys. Like them duck hunters running, blowing whistles, making noise. It's official, tell them missiles. I'm the dizzle, flow sizzle, flow sizzle. I'm off the hizzy, busy sizzle. No, I got that hustle muscle for that green like the fuck rig. No, not from New Orleans, but can you see me, homie? In oh, my check, check one two. If it ain't a check attached, that's all I'm gon' do. My check, check one two. If you ain't talking dollars, I can't understand you. My check, check one two. If it ain't a check attached, that's all I'm gon' do. My check. Check one two. Yeah. If you ain't talking dollars, Let's I go. can't understand you. Yeah. Look around, left, right, up and down. Ain't nobody like me. Wrist so icy, colors like ice tea. Them diamonds get pricey. Got rich now, everybody so nice to me. I'm a whiz kid. 
Doogie Howser Just like the game, snatch your dame, I'm Bowser Spit hot flames, stay sagging in my trousers Even on church day, the preacher like, no way And Miss Jenkins like, Lord, take them demons away In my headphones, Jesus walks by Kanye Mac into a chicky, trying to get some kissy kissy You can nibble on my neck, but uh-uh, no hickey Mic check, check one, two If it ain't a check or text, that's all I'm gonna do Mic check, check one, two If you ain't talking dollars, I can't understand you Mic check, check one, two If it ain't a check or text, that's all I'm gonna do Mic check, check one, two If you ain't talking dollars, I can't understand you Baby, I'm the bomb diggy Girls be begging for another chance like I'm Biggie uh, I run the city, call me P. Diddy My life's Whoopi Goldberg, it ain't nothing pretty It's been a long time coming, this ain't happen quickly Overnight, try more like Over and over into the morning light Steady trying to get it right